Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I know it's last day, last session, so I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Carlos Bonet. I'm a PhD student at the Columbia Business School. And today, I'm going to be presenting Lotteries for Shared Experiences, a joint work with Nick Arnosti. Yeah, I'm going to stay here then. Great. OK, so um, a typical assumption in matching models is that agents only care, only care about their own allocation. However, in practice, we see that there are many examples where that not, that's not the case. For example, in a school choice, siblings might wish to attend the same school together. Or couples entering into the residency might want to, be, might want to enroll in programs in the same region. And a group of friends may want to just share a hike or attend a show together. So um, since externalities are in general hard to handle, theory offers little guidance on how to accommodate such preference, on how to design mechanisms to accommodate, to accommodate such preferences. And in practice, a variety of ad hoc solutions are used. So um, in this talk, we're not going to solve all externality problems, but we're going to focus on those three examples that share two key features. So first, we're allocating an homogeneous item. And second, people want to share it as part of a group. So uh, let me present a concrete example of a problem. So popular Broadway shows have lotteries for discounted tickets. And here we see the website of the lottery for The Lion King. And this lottery works as follows. So for each performance, a limited number of tickets is sold to the winners of the, of the lottery. The night before of the performance, the lottery starts accepting applicants. And the morning of the show, winners are announced, and they have 60 minutes to pay for the tickets. So uh, in order to enter the lottery, people have to go to this website and fill this form. And here I would like to highlight something. So here we can see that an applicant can request either one or two tickets. After they submit this form, they will see this, this uh, message confirming that, confirming that they entered the lottery. And the next morning, if they are as lucky as me, they're going to see this email telling them that they won the lottery. So there are two issues here that I would like to highlight. The first one is that both members of a couple could enter this lottery and request two tickets each. So they're going to have roughly twice the, ch the chance of winning compared to a single applicant. And moreover, if both members of a couple win, they're going to get four tickets, they, they, but they only needed two. So there's going to be a waste of two tickets. And in fact, here I have another example where we, where we do see that multiple winners happen in practice. So uh, the Big Sur Marathon has a lottery for people that want to enter the competition as part of a group. And in the rules, they explicitly say that only one person from the group should enter the drawing on behalf of the whole group. However, in practice, this doesn't happen. Here we have a list of winners. And we can see that there are two teams, there are two winners, um, two, two teams that, that won tickets that are both called Taylors. And there are also two teams called What the Hill. So we do see that multiple winners happen in practice. So um, in this talk, I will try to answer the following question. Basically, can we propose simple mechanisms that are approximately efficient and approximately fair? And we're going to consider two different settings. So in the first, set, in the first setting, we're going to let applicants to list the member of the group. So for example, I'm going to say I'm in a group with Nick Arnosti. And in this setting, um, we will see that a mechanism that we call the group lottery is both uh, approximately efficient and approximately fair. However, implementing this mechanism might not be feasible for all applications. Note that you must have an interface, an interface that allows you, allows you to declare what are the members of your group. So we also consider another setting where applicants can only request a number of tickets. So in this setting, instead of saying that I'm in a group with Nick, I will say I want to request two tickets. And here, um, we're going to show that the mechanism that is mo most common used in practice, that we we're, we're going to refer to as the individual lottery, can lead to arbitrary inefficient and arbitrary 
and fair outcomes. However, we're gonna propose a mechanism that only requires minor modifications to the individual lottery, and we will see that um, it obtains similar performance guarantees as the group lottery. So, um, I'm gonna introduce the model using this picture. So here we have six identical tickets that we must allocate to the set of eight agents. And we're gonna determine this allocation using a mechanism. And the dynamics here are as follows. So first, each agent takes an action. And then based on these actions, the mechanism determines an allocation. So in our model, an allocation simply indicates for each agent the number of tickets they, they got. In this case, the allocation, uh, here we have that agents three, six, and seven obtain two tickets each. So now we have the allocation, but we must determine if they're happy or not with it. So in our model, we're gonna partition the set of individuals into these joint groups. Here we have four groups <clears throat> represented by different colors. And we're gonna say that an individual is happy with the allocation if and only if, collectively, the members of a group obtaining enough tickets for everyone in the group. So in particular here, the blue group and the gray group are not happy, and by contrast, the orange and the black group are both happy. So there are three things here that I would like to highlight. The first one is that even though agent three obtained two tickets, this is still unhappy as the blue group is short two tickets. Um, the second thing is that individual six only needed one ticket, but obtained two tickets, so there's one ticket wasted there. And finally, note that individual A obtained no tickets, but is still happy since the black group collectively has two tickets, and that's enough for both of them. So here we have six tickets, and we only have three happy agents, so we're gonna call this ratio the utilization, and this is going to be our efficiency measure. We can think of a different um, allocation. Here we're giving one ticket for uh, each of the first six agents, and here we have that uh, the first six agents are happy, so here the utilization is um, going to be six over six. Of course, um, we can formalize this. Uh, an instance in our, in our setting corresponds to a number of tickets, a number of agents, and a group structure. A feasible um, assignment corresponds to a vector that indicates for each agent the number of tickets that uh, she obtained. And of course, it must be such that the total number of tickets awarded cannot exceed the number of tickets available. Given a feasible allocation, we're going to say that the utility of agent I is one, if and only if the total number of tickets awarded to her group is at least her group size. And finally, we're also gonna allow for randomness here, where a random allocation is simply a probability distribution over the set of feasible allocations. And given a, a random allocation P, the utility of agent I is simply gonna be the expected utility where the expectation here is taken with respect to uh, the random allocation P. So um, I'm gonna introduce two, uh, two performance metrics. Um, first, given a random allocation, we're gonna say that the utilization of this random allocation is simply the expected number of happy individuals divided by the total number of tickets. And we're gonna say that a random allocation is very efficient if this utilization is at least beta. <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, we're gonna say that a random allocation is fair, and the informal description is that basically groups of different sizes should have uh, similar chances of winning. So for example, under a fair, under a fair random allocation, um, <clears throat> In the example that I mentioned at the beginning, in the Lion Kings, both a couple and a single applicant should have broadly um, similar chances of winning. So uh, formally, we say that a random allocation is beta fair if for every pair of agents, the ratio of, of their, their utilities is at least beta. And uh, let me introduce the last definitions. So a mechanism is, um, as usual, correspond to, is, is defined by two uh, uh, elements. First, we have an action set that defines the physical actions for every agent, and also an allocation function that maps action profiles to random allocations. 
So what is not that the standard in our definition is the notion of dominant actions. So we're not gonna look for profitable deviations of a single agent, but instead we are gonna assume that groups can coordinate, that members of a group can coordinate. So um, we're gonna look for deviations of the whole group. And formally, um, uh, and actions are dominant for a group if they maximize their utility with respect to all possible actions that um, agents not in the group might be taking. So um, let me present now the summary of the results. So we're gonna be looking at the worst case performance. So we're gonna study um, a specific uh, allocation rules and we're gonna look at their that the worst case performance However, we cannot look at the worst case performance over all instances, because as we show in the paper, there are some bad instances where no, uh, there are some extreme instances where no mechanism uh, can, do, can, do, can obtain good performance uh, guarantees. And in particular, what is happening on those instances is that you have, uh, that you have groups that, that are very large, in the sense that they require most of the tickets in order to be successful. So instead of looking at the worst case uh, performance guarantees over all instances, we're gonna look at the worst case performance guarantees over this family of instances characterized by two parameters. So parameter alpha is an upper bound on the supply demand ratio. So intuitively, when alpha is close, is close to zero, we, we, have, we have a very competitive lottery. So we have a few tickets relative to the number of applicants. And when alpha is close to one, we have almost enough tickets for everyone. The second parameter here, uh, in this relates with um, the bad instances that I just described, is gonna be an upper bound uh, on the size of the largest group relative to the number of tickets. So if kappa is close to zero, we have a small groups that only require a few tickets relative to the number of tickets available. And when kappa is close to one, we're gonna have groups that require almost all the tickets in order to be happy. So, <clears throat> Let me now jump to the results. So um, the first result that we have here is a benchmark. And this is saying basically what is the best thing that we can hope for, which in this case is being one minus cap efficiency and one fair. And how can we think about this benchmark? Well, we could think about this from an optimization perspective. So let me ignore the incentives for a while. And we will say, okay, let's have an optimization model, an optimization problem where we have fairness as a constraint. So we're gonna look for a random allocation that satisfy um, a beta fairness constraint. And we're gonna maximize the efficiency that we could obtain. So what, is this, what this is telling us is basically that um, what we can obtain is one minus kappa efficiency and one fair. And actually what we show in the paper is that if we go beyond one kappa, one kappa efficiency, we cannot obtain a constant fairness factor. So um, then we look at a specific mechanism. So in the first one, in the group lottery, we're gonna allow agents to declare the members of the group. And here we're gonna have similar uh, performance guarantees as in the benchmark, but now we have a two kappa loss in the fairness factor. And later I'm gonna explain where this factor is coming from. So then we study two mechanisms where we let individuals to request a number of tickets. And here we have the most common mechanism, the individual lottery. And we see that it can lead to arbitrary unfair and arbitrary inefficient outcomes. However, um, by doing minor modifications to the individual lottery, we have here the weighted individual lottery. And we see that we recover similar performance guarantees as the one in the group lottery. And actually, when alpha is very close to zero, so we have a very competitive lottery, we recover the same uh, guarantees as in the group lottery. So let me start with the group lottery. So here, as I just said, an agent is basically declaring, declaring a subset of agents. And then we're going to say that a set S is valid if every agent in this set declares S as their group. Then we simply put place uh, valid groups in an uniform random order and we process them sequentially. So what we show here is that it's dominant for groups to truthfully reveal, the, reveal their group. And moreover, we show that um, any dominant strategic equilibrium here is going to be one minus kappa efficient and one minus two kappa fair. So um, let, let me here just say that um, 
here we don't have uh, multiple winners. And here uh, we have that small groups can have advantage over large group. So when we have a few tickets, small groups still can be successful, whereas large group don't. And as I mentioned, um, here we have a two cup affair uh, loss. And basically, this is coming from the fact that we're using a uniform random order. And in the paper, we, dis we discussed how we could avoid that um, two kappa loss in the fairness factor by implementing a fair group lottery. So then um, we have the individual lottery. Here, is, this is very similar as the group lottery, but now we're processing agents instead of valid groups. Note here that um, the request that agents make doesn't affect the order in which they are processed. So here is dominant to request at least, at least your group size. And what we show here is that there exists an instance such that any dominant strategic equilibrium of this mechanism is not going to be epsilon efficient nor epsilon fair. And let me give here a, a little bit of intuition. Basically, um, what you can think of is having a large group of size, um, of size sub, that is sublinear and a bunch of small groups. And then what's happening there is that this large group is getting almost all of the tickets. So it's getting an advantage over the small groups. However, um, since its size is, is sub sublinear, when in a scale, um, you get no efficiency um, guarantees. So um, very briefly, then we have the third mechanism where we don't use a uniform random order anymore. But instead, we're going to um, sample individuals with a probability inversely proportional to their request. And what we show here is that um, basically we obtain very similar guarantees as in the group lottery. However, here we have a G of alpha factor. So uh, here I have the plot of the function G, which is always smaller than 1. When, when x is close to 0, we have that this is 1. And when x is 1, we have that is equal to 1 minus e to the minus 1, which is, um, which is around 0.63. So let me wrap up. Basically, uh, what are our recommendations for practice? If you can, uh, you should use the group lottery. Otherwise, um, if you cannot implement that interface, you should use the weighted individual lottery, which is much better than the mechanism that is most used in practice. So I run over time. So that's all I have for today. Thanks. Are there questions in the room? And if so, please, uh, Carlos, if you could repeat the question, that would be great. Oh, yeah. So I guess um, what I often do when I try to get rare goods like this, like say going to 11 Madison Park or something, I just buy four tickets and I later figure out who I'm going to eat dinner with. Um, and I'm wondering if you can sort of extend like your, your group lottery mechanism required everybody to be identified ex ante. And I guess relatedly, like I could imagine if I'm going to the Lion King, I could be happy to go with just my boyfriend or in a larger group. And like, you know, if I get only two tickets, I'll take go with just my boyfriend. If I get five tickets, I'll go with a group of friends. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, basically the question was something like, um, I think that there are two parts. One was, um, what would happen if, oh, okay, so I remember the, the two questions. So the first one was, here in our model, we have to identify all the members of the group, especially in the group lottery. How could we, um, and, and in practice, people uh, sometimes do, doesn't decide who's, who is going to join them just after they, they bought the tickets. And the second question is, um, what would happen how could we model situations where, well, I'm going to be happy if I go, I, I just go with my partner, but I would be also happy if I go with our other three friends, something like that. So um, regarding the second part of the question, we are working on that, actually, going away from these dichotomous preferences. And yeah, most of the of results under certain conditions are going to also hold on, on those, under those type of preference, where you could think about, if you just got a fraction of your tickets, you're going to have some, some fraction of your total utility. And regarding the first part of the question, um, 
there are some issues when you let people kind of, so, so if you don't make, the, if you don't force people to kind of verify their identity, there are other problems that comes uh, from, from the implementation side. So um, yeah, we're, we're working on modeling that, but, but there's some sub subtle things that you have to take into account. So yeah, I'm happy to talk more about that offline. Thank you. Uh, let's